Well, it's my huge pleasure to be here. I'm only sorry that I can't be with you in person. Um, the, uh, the, the story of Northfield House is something which I think some of you know is very, very close to my heart. Having lived there now for nearly 21 years, you might notice there's a slightly echoey quality to my voice. And the reason for that is that the house is now empty as we have sold the house and we'll be handing over to a wonderful couple uh, who are actually on this uh, call uh, and they will be taking over on the 14th of December. And I have to say that I couldn't be more delighted that having grafted away at this place for uh, more than 20 years, I'm handing it over to a couple who appear to love it uh, in, for many of the same reasons as my wife and I do. What I propose to do this evening, uh, if you don't mind, is to split the talk into five sections. The first really is a very brief overview of why the house is special. What is it and why is it special? And I'm going to launch into that with a few illustrations, some of which will have the benefit of being before and after, so you can give me suitable uh, noises of approval when you see the after photographs, if you don't mind. <laughs> So it's a late 16th century Laird's house, not unremarkable in its original iteration, built about 1590 for the Hamiltons of Preston. At that stage, the house uh, consisted of a, a, an oblong block. You can see between the two uh, chimney stacks that run forwards and backwards in this photograph taken about 15 years ago. It was an oblong block with a stair turret on the uh, northwest corner and a vaulted ground floor, including kitchen and stores, quite normal for the period. In 1608, the house changed hands and was bought by an Edinburgh burgess called Joseph Marchbanks, spelt Marjorie Banks, and his wife, Marion Simisoon. Now, Marchbanks was a remarkable fellow. He was a burgess of Edinburgh, and I understand that he was a hat maker to James VI. He was also a significant landowner in East Lothian. Uh, at that time, he was the owner of the estate of Lochie, which his descendants sold to the Dalrymple family in 1699. Marchbanks and his wife were quite clearly intent on showing off a little of their status. And so they extended the house westwards. And you'll see that very, very steep, rather lumpy gable on the left of the picture. That's the westward extension, and it extends northward. So it essentially transformed the house into an L-plan house on three stories with an attic. Um, and the changes which were made by March Banks were actually very significant. For one thing, the door, which you see behind the uh, unflattering photograph of me, um, there's a very a very handsome door piece. I'll see whether I remember to do a photograph of it. No, I don't think I have. Um, well, you can feast your eyes on the, the more recent photograph. Um, the door piece is dated 1611 and has the armorial bearing of Joseph Marchbanks and his wife, Marion Simisu. And it commemorates the completion in 1611 of their comprehensive recasting of the house. Now, there are some features of that recasting that make the house a little bit interesting. First of all, um, the house was very clearly at that stage less of a defensive proposition than most houses of the period. So immediately behind the front door, you'll find a, stale and, a scale and plat stair, something which in 1611 was pretty unusual in Scotland, turnpikes being the, the more common kind of stair. And the, what's significant of it, about it is that a turnpike stair is easier to defend than a scale and plat stair. And so this was definitely something which was a nod towards modernity, elegance, and a move away from pure defensiveness. The other interesting feature of the alterations was the addition on the top floor of the new extension um, you can see um, a window on the second floor just below the little dovecot in the gable end there. That window lights a long gallery. Now it's rather a short long gallery, but it's a long gallery nonetheless. Um, and 
it was completed the year before the Great Long Gallery at Pinky House. Um, and there are some things about it that are really fascinating, at least they are to me, and I hope they will be to you as well. Uh, what we have is an astounding survival of some early painted finishes. Now, I'm just going to scroll forwards, and these are two views of the outside from, from the west. Uh, I'll, I'll skip past them quickly, and there's the door piece. Okay, the, the motto is, except the Lord bulled in vain bulls man, which is the Scots version of the Edinburgh motto, Nisi Dominus Frustra, without God, uh, nothing, nothing can be built, really, in rough translation. What I propose to do is to show you a few photographs which will show you the features I've just been talking about. Well, that's another exterior, apologies. Um, and an interior, yeah. Now, I th the reason why I'm getting this out of order is that I can't remember the order without seeing the thumbnail. So apologies if it's slightly disjointed, but the idea was to give you an idea of the house and the condition it was in when I took it over. And we will then have a look at some of those internal features that I've just been talking about. Right, painted decoration. <laughs> The house has an astounding array, uh, three complete rooms on the first floor with um, unrestored painted decoration dating from 1611. In this picture, you'll see traces on the undersides of joists of a lath and plaster ceiling, which was put in in the 1690s and only removed by my predecessor, Schomburg Scott in 1956. So these painted ceilings were obscured for over a quarter of a millennium. And that may well be one reason why they've survived in such good condition. Mm. There's another view, that's the ceiling in what we're calling the yellow bedroom, and is perhaps the best in the house, almost complete, although you can see that some of the undersides of joists have been adsed away to level them off to take the plaster ceiling in the 1690s. Now, this is a fragment of wall decoration, which we found in a cupboard in the Long Gallery. Now, the Long Gallery uh, was decorated with this kind of arcading, which you can see is painted there on wooden planks, but continued also on the external wall on the plaster originally. I think what's so fascinating about this is that if you know houses like Pinky or the great political houses of England, of the same era, such as Audley End and Hatfield, which were finished only five years before this, you will see design work which is no more sophisticated than that. What's different is that the Scottish version or the East Lothian version is painted on wood, much as you would see in the north of Germany, much of the Low Countries and all of Scandinavia. So what we have here is uh, evidence that a uh, an East Lothian laird was sufficiently versed in, interested in, and desirous of being part of a Renaissance culture um, which was flourishing all over Northern Europe, that he wished to replicate it in his, uh, in his family seat in East Lothian, and he did so using techniques which were well established by that time in Scotland. Uh, in the form of uh, painted decoration on timber and straight onto plaster. You'll see ex similar examples in Traquair House, which I think date from the 1560s. There are earlier ones at Keneal House. And then, of course, there are famous ones in Aberdeenshire at such places as Crathis and uh, other well-known castles up there. But in the majority of cases, those uh, painted finishes have been restored one way or another. And what I think is unique about Northfield is that not one of these painted ceilings or other painted decorative panels has ever been touched by the restorer's brush. And for that reason, not only, not only are they unique, but they are the most authentic example of what they are that you'll find, I think, anywhere in Scotland. Now that's a view of the lower stair, but I'm not quite sure why I've included it. So I'll pass on to the next picture if I may. Yes, a another fascinating thing about the house is that 
it went through many uh, separate updatings or uh, uh, transformations to make it fashionable. But, but the house was never grand enough uh, that it was doubled in size or uh, burdened with a vast Victorian wing or a ballroom or anything like that. And that may well be why the house is, still survives. But what has happened is that over the centuries, incremental efforts have been made to make it more comfortable and more up to date. And this window is the very first of them. Most of you will know that sash and casement windows came to Scotland in the 1680s when the Duke of Lauderdale was in charge of remodelling Holyrood Palace for the King. Um, now he was effectively Secretary of State for Scotland and he uh, hugely enlarged and embellished his house at Thurlston. He also owned Brunston House and his brother owned Hatton Castle in West Lothian, now sadly demolished. But one of the things that, that they brought to Scotland was the sash and casement window, and it completely transformed what Scottish buildings have looked like since. And what's lovely about this one is that it's a very, very early example. I would put the date at somewhere between 1695 and 1710. It's made of oak. It, um, has no parting beads, so the, the sashes simply slide against each other. Um, but it's been there working and still works perfectly some 300 years later, which I think is an extraordinary achievement for any piece of joinery, especially in this climate. There's also some very pretty ironmongery on the shutters, which you can't see in the photograph, but they're exactly of a piece with the window. Uh, now, uh, kitchen, God, uh, that was uh, the kitchen after we stripped out all the melamine panels and uh, damaged plaster work and opened the, the fireplace up. Um, it was a bit of a state. Um, I think the brightest thing in the picture is my friend's dog's eyes peering out from the fireplace there. Um, but before I go on to that, what I'd like to do is just say a word, a very quick word about the history. The house was built for the Hamiltons of Preston, who were the local lairds and who occupied Preston Tower, now a ruin just a couple of hundred yards from Northfield House. They were quite a powerful family and quite wealthy, and we think that Northfield House might have been built either for a sibling or as a dower house, but I haven't uh, searched exhaustively to, to try and find out exactly what its relationship with Hamilton House was. It's a slightly odd layout in the sense that you have a medieval castle with a, a 17th century belvedere on top, and then Northfield House uh, a century later, and then Hamilton House, an early 17th century mansion, all within 50 yards, and they, were, they all belonged to members of the same family. So it's a little bit unusual to have houses of this status clustered together. But anyway, it was the Hamiltons of Preston, very soon, though, after the house was built, it was sold to Joseph Marchbanks and his wife. And the Marchbanks family owned the house for about 100 years and sold then to a family called Nisbet uh, in 1703. Thereafter, the house changed hands and was bought by the Syme family, I think, in 1746. Interestingly, there's no mention of the house whatsoever in any account of the Battle of Preston Pans. And I think either the Symes or the Nisbets were a canny Scottish lawyers, and they probably decided to retreat to Edinburgh to await the outcome of the battle before pinning their colours to the winning mast. And so the house doesn't feature in the accounts of the battle at all, and mercifully it wasn't damaged. Although um, the buyers of the house, I hope, are delighted that, that uh, a cannonball fired at the battle was uh, found in the garden by Miss McNeil's gardeners sometime in the 1940s. Um, after the Symes, the estate, which then extended to, I think, 109 acres, was bought by a, a coal mining engineer from Wishaw, James McNeil, and he sunk the penny pit at Preston Pans, which operated until 1980 and provided the income for McNeil and his family. Now, I think he only had daughters, and eventually the house and estate were inherited by McNeil's daughter, 
uh, who lived in the house until her death, I think, in 1951 or two. And it was then that the estate was uh, broken up and the house in its uh, just under two acre garden was sold to my predecessor, Schomburg Scott, who uh, was an architect, I think, well known to many of you uh, who are interested in historical architecture. He was a, a pioneer, very much so a pioneer of renovation of early buildings for reuse. And I think it's to him that we owe a huge debt of gratitude because although some of what he did, I don't necessarily approve of 100%, I am absolutely sure that if he and his wife had not taken the house on in 1952, the council would have knocked it down as they did three quarters of historic Preston Pans. So may I say a huge thank you to Schomburg Scott and his family who lived here for nearly 50 years. Schomburg Scott died in 1998 and his son James had hopes to uh, renovate the place, but he realized that it was a bit beyond him. And by that time, the house was in quite poor condition. So he put it on the market and it languished for two or three years. And eventually a friend of mine phoned me up and said, your house is on the market, you have to buy it. Uh, I had no idea what she was talking about, but a year later I went north to have a look and it only took one look and I was completely smitten. It seems to have that effect on people. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I bought the house in 2000 and the last 20 years have been a very happy mix of hard graft, but also great, great times. It's the most wonderful house for entertaining uh, in the winter, but also the garden is very beautiful. And in the summer, it's most glorious place just to be or to have garden parties or whatever. So uh, that um, is a very, very quick potted history of the house. You might ask, why, why would I take on such a thing? I was single then. Um, my uh, long-suffering wife joined me five years later. Um, I had always wanted to take on a historic building and live in it. Um, and this, it seemed to me to, to answer so many of the, the, the wish list of things that would be wonderful to enjoy. Uh, uh, Early, an early building, but with later detail, panelled rooms, some wonderful Regency plaster work, a terrific stair, um, and then this glorious garden facing south um, and, and enclosed on all sides, so very sheltered and very secluded. Um, I did, one or two of my friends were somewhat uncertain about the enterprise. Uh, the, I think that 20 years ago, there was still a measure of prejudice against uh, ex-mining towns in East Lothian. Um, and I'm afraid that Edinburghers can be rather annoying about that sort of thing. Um, and quite often I've had remarks such as, my goodness, I've no idea that there was such a house in Preston Pans. I thought it was nothing but council houses. Well, that kind of ignorance is both annoying and needs to be corrected. And I've done my level best over the uh, uh, succeeding 20 years to let people know that Preston Pans is a place with the most extraordinary history. It has more listed buildings than any other settlement of its size in East Lothian. More than that, I've been made very welcome in the community in Preston Pans, and I can say with my hand on my heart that uh, until tonight, I couldn't be happier or more proud to, to live in a place than Northfield House in Preston Pans. And I very much hope that my successors here will feel exactly the same, and I'm very confident they will. So um, that, I'll just say a quick word about what my th thoughts in relation to the actual renovation were. I was determined not to scrape the house back and make it like a new house in an old box. You see uh, many restorations of uh, earlier periods where the soul of the house has really been lost. And I think that there are many things that need to be done extremely carefully and with, with uh, a great deal of trepidation, really, if you're going to maintain the soul of a house as well as turning it into something which is practical and comfortable and nice to live in. Um, windows, I think, are the, the, the most obvious example of that. If you take out an old window 
and lose all its historic glass. It's like pulling the eyes out of a house. And you would be amazed what can be done with a dilapidate, dilapidated old window. There is nothing that is not repairable. If you know what you're doing, use the right materials and take your time and take a lot of care. And the result of that is that there are 48 windows in that house and the only new windows are windows that were put in where no window was there before. All the others have been meticulously taken to bits, in some cases deglazed, uh, new timber pieced in where necessary, reglazed and put back. Um, and the result is that when you walk past the house, the house, it's almost as though the house speaks to you because the glass is, that wonderful uh, crown glass is, is winking at you and catching the light in that way that you can only get with historic glass. So I think windows are very, very important. The next thing is joinery. And of course, in any renovation, you, um, you are likely to come up against things that have really got to the end of their life. And, and they're really beyond practical repair. And it seems to me that in those circumstances, what you have to do is be very choosy about the materials you use, such that when you replace a piece of old material, be it a floorboard or a panel, not only is the wood stable, but it's the right sort of consistency um, and the right color, such that in a year or two, you can barely tell that it's something new. In other words, it's a very close match to what was there. And you'll see some pictures later on um, that, oh, well, that's that's the after for the kitchen. I'll come on to, I'll, I'll do a tour properly in a minute. I'll just finish a couple of points about the renovation. Um, what did we find? Well, I didn't get a survey on the house because I thought it would be a waste of time. My brother and I have done a lot of restoration of buildings and I've been um, enjoying and restoring buildings now for over 40 years. So we felt that there was nothing that we wouldn't be able to spot that would be spotted by a surveyor. And if we couldn't spot anything that gave us the heebie-jeebies, then it was unlikely a surveyor would. So we had a good old look and we discovered that there uh, that the house has its original roof, the most extraordinary structure, beautiful Baltic pine trees, roughly squared and then mortised and tenoned and pegged with wooden pegs. That roof has been on the main house since 1590 and on the wing since 1611, and it's in great condition. Uh, and it's an absolutely beautiful thing to behold. Um, so there's huge pleasure in that. Uh, we found uh, some eroded stonework, um, and the biggest uh, worry really was that the chimney heads were in terrible condition, having been rebuilt sometime in the early 19th century with Musselburgh stone, they had eroded to powder, um, and in one case there wasn't really much left, uh, more than the harling on the outside with a few stones along the top. Uh, so. So, so, so that was really quite a, a big undertaking on the exterior. As far as the interior was concerned, uh, there was very little wiring and most of it 60 years old. There was no heating. The plumbing was restricted to a kitchen sink and one bathroom. Um, and uh, yes, a little bit primitive in a cold winter. So it was decided that we should uh, incrementally install heating and uh, an Argo was another essential to make the place livable in and comfortable with plenty of hot water and a suitable means of cooking. So those kinds of interventions had to be made but the question was how do you do this without tearing the place to bits and thereby, thereby sacrificing a lot of uh, important historic fabric. And the job was made more difficult by the fact that all these uh, wonderful painted ceilings mean that there are no voids in which to run pipes and wires. So you have to be much, much more clever in finding routes for such things that are not visible from above or from below. And um, you can make your own judgment about that when you see the photographs. Um, there are some other wonderful survivals as well, apart from the painted ceilings. Uh, there are some terrific 16th century studded doors. Um, and one of them was an external door and became an object lesson in how to, uh, how to salvage something authentic out of a rotten old door. It's now a beautiful and perfect door, about a third of which is modern oak, but the rest of it is 
16th century. So we were able to, to save a, a high proportion of the early fabric uh, and match new timber Scottish oak to the old, such that you have to look very closely to see the joints. I'm, very, I'm pretty proud of that, actually. That and the window work were, were the two things which I, I've taken perhaps the greatest pride in getting right. Um, floors, um, what was the source of timber? Well, there was a very unfortunate demolition in Lauriston Place in the 19, no, the, in the early tw 2000s. A row of very fine Victorian houses were knocked down. God knows how they got away with it, but I bought all the joists from that and had them remilled as flooring. And they were exactly the right color and lovely dense, slow grown um, pine. Uh, and I had them remilled to the same size as the boards that came out. And I think when you see some of the photographs, you'll, I hope you'll agree that they look as though they've always been there. Now, let me see what else. Um, finishes. Well, I'm, I'm a great uh, fan of um, matte paints um, and particularly woodwork. There's a, there's a terrible trend towards such things as um, acrylic, which not only isn't a very durable finish, but it's an impossible to remove once it's there. And if you're thinking ahead, let's say a house is repainted every 30 years, um, over, over, over 100 years, that's three repaints. You have to be able to get the old paint off if you're going to preserve the detail. And therefore, I've, I've always used uh, traditional oil-based paints for woodwork. Um, and emulsions directly onto plaster. And I have to confess that we've used um, uh, conventional emulsions, but more recently we've used natural emulsions produced by a company called Edward Bulmer in England, which is rather expensive, but the paint is really wonderful and um, is more breathable than the modern conventional emulsions. Uh, on, on the floors, there's always a, a bit of an argument. Do you go for um, uh, um, polyurethane or a modern varnish, or do you go for wax finish? And I think in the public areas, I've gone for, um, for a polyurethane finish because you can sand it down, uh, which you can't with some of the acrylic-based um, varnishes. And similarly, uh, some of the oil, uh, oil the, the Wax-based ones are, are not terribly good in uh, public areas where there are gritty, muddy feet coming through. Right, now I'm going to take you through a very quick tour of principal rooms so you can see what they looked like and how they look now. So I'm going to start with the kitchen and go back. That was the A before view of the kitchen, uh, which you saw previously, and that is well, that was the view until yesterday. Unfortunately, it's now completely empty. <laughs> um, these were actually pictures which were taken for the, uh, by the estate agent for the sale of the house. Um, and I think the photographer has done rather a good job. Next, we're in, uh, in an entrance hall, which is part of what was the original great hall of the house. The Great Hall was divided up in about 1690 into an antechamber and now what's a dining room. And we're just in the antechamber looking through into the dining room. That's another view of the same space with the dining room through the open door. Now, I, I can't really tell whether I'm giving you enough time or not. So if I see um, grimaces or protesting looks on any of the faces, then I'll know I'm going too fast. And that's a, a view of the same. You'll see in that picture the wonderful studded oak doors, which date from the 1590s. That door on the right, the one that's standing open, is held up, held on by uh, uh, enormous um, wrought iron hinges, which are nailed to the door. And those nails have never been removed. Now, because of the way it was built, you cannot remove that door without taking the hinges off the door. Therefore, I can say with confidence that that door has been hanging and swinging for 440 years. And it's dead square and it's in perfect condition. Now, if I were a joiner, I'd be pretty happy thinking that something I had created with my own hands was going to be functional 
four centuries after it was created. I hope you agree. Next, oh, that's now that's a Regency stair. Um, I suppose I should have gone a little bit into the, the other changes in the building. The, the first major change was in the 1690s when the early windows were changed to sash and case windows. The Great Hall was divided up um, and the rooms upstairs were recast in a more um, homely uh, um, and fashionable style with panelled bedrooms and so on. What you see here is a very elegant stone cantilever stair put in in the 1820s. I understand there was a marriage in the family in the, 18, in the late 1820s, which I think would uh, tally quite well with the style of this stair. And I can well imagine that the wife will have been shown the house and will have said, um, well, I, I will marry you and I will come and live you, with you at Northfield, but really, I need a decent stair. Uh, so that, I think, is the result of that uh, change in family status. Oh, I had to put this in because it's an example of um, some joinery I did. We had to replace the floor on the second floor completely because it was so uh, wormy and uneven and it had been hacked and repaired so often. But this was very tricky because you can see on the right there's a curve where the landing goes round. Um, and I was rather proud of my joinery making the planks fit the curve. <laughs> so that's my little boast for the evening. This was 2001, where we had just uh, renovated the panelling, but the floor in the dining room had been taken out. It was a, it was a close call. The, I would say a third of the floor was too soft and wormy to be retrievable. So the options were to repair it or to take it out and replace it altogether. And I chose the latter option because that enabled us to run uh, pipes and wires neatly under the floor um, into the right places in the room and then have a serviceable floor at the end of it. So that what you're seeing is me walking on a rubble infill above the vault, which uh, lies above the ground floor. I apologize, these photographs are a little bit um, um, fuzzy, but this is a picture of the fireplace wall in the dining room, that same room you just saw a photograph of. Um, we had to take the panelling out to repair it. And what we found was fascinating. We could unravel the history of the alterations to windows and other things. But also you'll see on the right, halfway up, there's a piece of wood going across that seems to have decoration on it. And that indeed is what it is. It's a, a scrap of decorated timber reused in the house to brace later panelling. I don't know where it came from, presumably somewhere else in the house, but all over the place there are fragments of uh, timber that have painted decoration on them that has simply been reused as lath for lath and plaster or for bracing panelling or for other purposes. Um, in fact, I've got a fragment that I'm going to hand on to the buyers of uh, lath that came out of a ceiling in the upper floor which has a, a roundel with a lion rampant on it. Um, and that was simply saved from uh, three pieces of lath that were, had been nailed together. That's a, a view in the yellow bedroom. And you'll see uh, a 19th century black marble fireplace. But behind it, you'll see some decoration on the plaster. And that's a frieze that runs around the early 17th century fireplace, all now obscured by panelling and also a segmental arched recess behind the panelling, which is now completely obscured as well. So there are amazing secrets hiding behind later panelling. Um, and um, I suppose one approach might have been to pull all the panelling out and expose the earlier stuff. But to my mind, the panelling is uh, a work of art in its own right. So we'll just have to content ourselves by knowing what exciting things are there behind it. That's another view of the dining room with the panelling partially dismantled. And the same again. Now let's, oh, now we've got some after photographs. Um, that's the dining room set for lunch um, and, and photographed for sale. Um, the, the buyers will recognise that uh, view of the room. That gives you an idea of what the room feels like now. And here's a, a, a fuller view of the dining room as it is now. Not the most enormous room in, in the world. It's about 22 foot by 15. 
um, but it has sufficient height to give it a real sense of architecture um, at the same time as being rather cosy. So with a coal fire uh, and um, a dozen people and a few candles, it's a most wonderful room to have dinner in, especially in the winter. Right, now we move on to one of the principal bedrooms. This is on the first floor. Um, and once again, you can see it has one of these extraordinary painted ceilings that was covered up like the others in the 1690s and then re-exposed in 1956. Um, I'm just wondering whether you can see, I think it's another photograph that shows better a fragment of wall decoration, which will give you, yes, will give you an idea of what the room looked like in 1611. It's um, pretty overwhelming, uh, to be honest, even for my lush taste. Um, but the whole of the room was decorated in that uh, painted uh, way uh, with, on that wall, a hunting scene. Uh, to, to the left of the hunting dog, there's a hoofed animal, and below it, an animal, or the rear end of an animal with a brush. That's all that survives of the painted decoration on the walls. So it's a, it's a, a fragment, a glimpse, if you like, of what the room would have looked like and felt like in 1611. Um, I, I think I might have forgotten to mention what the medium of the paint is. It's egg tempera with, um, so I think that's egg albumen uh, mixed with, um, with uh, pigments and then done freehand. Um, and apparently it was very, very widespread in Scotland and there were a few itinerant families who constantly went around the country painting people's houses. Um, that's an example of the sort of intervention we had to do in panelled rooms. Um, in the yellow bedroom, which we'll see a, a better picture of in a minute, the problem was that the woodworm had gone right down the edge of the panelling so that the panelling was popping out. So I had to pull the panels out, uh, glue, cut off the wormy wood, glue new wood onto the edge, plane it down and put it back in so that it would be retained by its um, mouldings. Um, and um, the result is that. <laughs> a very pretty room which faces south uh, and overlooks the garden um, and has been the, uh, a comfortable respite for many, many visitors from all over the world. You'll see in this picture there's a, a rather large um, recess that the bed sticks into. It's actually a, a buffet recess because this was once the dining room. Uh, about as inconveniently placed as it could be, being at the opposite end of the house from the kitchen. But hey, I suppose if you had staff to carry the food or didn't mind congealed bacon and eggs, you could live with that. Now we go up a floor to the, I'm calling it the master bedroom, but it's uh, just because it's the master's bedroom. At this level, the house is much less grand. Uh, the ceiling height is about nine feet. But what's lovely about it is that it was refitted in the 1690s, so it has a lot of terrific early woodwork, including this little door, which formerly led into a dressing room. And you can see the lugged architrave and some uh, rather pretty uh, panelling and, and detailing. Now, the, every last bit of that panelling had to be taken out um, and be repaired and put back, and the floor had to be replaced as well. So it was a a smallish room, but a huge amount of work. That's another view of the same room. Um, and you can see just very, very simple, but generous late 17th century woodwork. Another view. Now that's the only fireplace in the house that doesn't work, I'm ashamed to say. And it only doesn't work because I haven't, I, I never got round to opening it up. All the chimneys are uh, now open and uh, working. So I, I, I shouldn't have shown you that. <laughs> Incidentally, we chose the, the blue and white um, chinoiserie paper um, for a couple of reasons. The, the, the first intention was to hang these upper bedrooms with cloth. We'd found evidence that they were all cloth hung in the 1690s, but it's very difficult to find cloth that's durable and affordable and attractive. And my wife spotted this wallpaper and I thought, well, if this was uh, a room of the 1690s, that's more or less the time when Chinese export ware first came into Scotland. So let's, let's go Chinese in here. And you'll see there are a couple of plates on the wall that are actually uh, 
mid 18th century Chinese export ware. Oh, I think you've probably seen enough of this room. That's another view of the same room. Um, okay, another bedroom here. This is the one in the middle on the on the second floor. And the reason I include it is um, not because it's very similar to the room you've just seen, but because when we had when we were re renovating this room, I had to take the panelling out. It was in such awful condition, and I had to rebuild it completely. And when I did, I found that there was not one but two previous fireplaces still intact behind the panelling. So behind that um, very elegant um, mid-18th century style fireplace, which I'm incidentally made out of scrap, um, is a gigantic 16th century fireplace in perfect condition just sitting there. It's been sitting there since the house was built and has, has been obscured by later attempts to make the house more fashionable and more comfortable. And that's one of the real thrills of Northfield House, where you have layers of, of um, fabric which take you from the end of the 16th century right up to the, well, to the present day. Now we move to the Long Gallery, or the Short Long Gallery. Long galleries were invented um, as a means of providing exercise in the winter, I'm not sure you'd get terribly fit walking backwards and forwards along this room since it's 33 feet long. Um, it started life uh, with a barrel vaulted wooden ceiling, which I'm sure was covered in painted decoration, uh, much as the other ceilings in the house were. But I think by uh, 1700 that had probably gone. And at the same time as the Regency staircase was put in, a decision was made to try to make this a more modern and fashionable room. Now, you can see the plaster work is fairly typical of the time, pretty austere, um, uh, but with a lovely barrel vault, which means the room has a decent height, even though the, the eaves of the house are seven or eight feet below the ceiling. So the ceiling goes right up into the steep roof. It doesn't look like a Regency drawing room in any way, shape or form, but I, I have to say, I think the outcome is quirky and charming, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, the fireplace is interesting. It came from Walmart House in uh, Midlothian, which was blown up in 1954, I think. Um, and all that's left of lovely Walmart House is that uh, fireplace and surround and overmantel, which Schomburg Scott saved from the wreckage and brought here to Northfield. That's another view of the same room, just to give you an idea looking the other way. So we're looking now more or less due north, from which there is a great view of the Firth of Forth. And the same again. And the same again. <laughs> You can see a 21st century uh, interloper there on the table in the form of a telly. Ah, right. Now we're going to go on to the garden. We think that the garden was reached its current layout in about 1830. That looks like the age of the magnificent weeping ash tree that stands in front of the house. Um, Schomburg Scott and his wife were very, very keen gardeners, but by the time they were getting on a bit in years, the garden was taking them over rather than the other way around. And by the time I came to the house, it was essentially like this. It, it was completely overgrown with brambles, trees in borders, you name it, uh, a really dreadful mess. And I was pretty daunted, I have to say. And it was my mum who came to my rescue she came down for an afternoon and she said, we're going to do one small border. And when you see what the two of us can do in an afternoon, you will realize what you can do in a couple of years. And she was right. So that is the same view today. Well, not today, a couple of summers ago. <laughs> today, the view is somewhat less leafy. Um, what else did I want to say about the garden? Uh, Yes, well, I mean, one needs to be practical. The garden's just under two acres, and uh, I think most of you will know how quickly things grow in the spring in East Lothian. 
is very fertile and the climate's pretty good. So it's quite a big garden to keep on top of, but it is the most heavenly place to be. Um, uh, I shouldn't say that since I'm moving house, but it's given us huge pleasure. That was the door, the view from the front door in 2000. And I'm going to show you the after photograph. Now, there it is. That was the same view in 2019. So you can see, very lucky, there's a, fan a fantastic stock of, uh, of trees and shrubs in the garden. To the left, would you believe, is a, a bay tree. It's the biggest bay tree I've ever seen. And to the right of that is a pear tree with two different varieties of pear grafted onto one stock. So it's got, a, it's got the real intimate feel of a Regency or early Victorian garden about it. And there's a sun trap facing due south. That was 2001, replanting, uh, or we, we had dug out the herbaceous border and we were replanting, and that was the same border two years ago. So you get the idea. <laughs> a lot of work, but um, I, 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 it's so rewarding to uh, put a bit of effort and love into a garden and just watch what it'll do for you. And uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. That's the yard of the house. I think you saw a very, very dowdy photograph of the same thing at the beginning of the uh, talk. And now you get, you get the idea. And another little view of a border. That was the border my mum helped me with when I was terrified of what to do with the garden in 2001. <laughs> there are now, uh, the roses have grown up a bit since then. And that's the front door uh, as it is now. Another view of the uh, of the the area to the front of the garden. As I say, a complete sun trap. The the little trees either side of the front door are now about eight feet high and produced over a hundred ripe pears this summer. So uh, they've done very well. And that finally, I think, is the present day view of the house restored as far as I have taken it. Um, I have to say that the ground floor we have left, uh, I used it principally as storage and workshops, and uh, perhaps that's where the new owners will have some fun stamping their own authority on the place. But uh, anyway, uh, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that uh, I couldn't be more happy to have spent 20 years here. I couldn't be happier to be handing it on to the wonderful couple who are taking it over. I'm proud to have been associated with it, and I've done what I set out to do, which was to hand the house on truly in good heart, uh, such that it will go on existing and being loved, I hope, for many generations to come. And I think that's probably all I have to say, but I'd be delighted to take questions if anybody wants to ask any. Well, thank you very much, Finlay. That was um, quite a story. Um, Obviously, a labour of love. I'm surprised that you wanted to leave at all, um, <laughs> because uh, the house looks absolutely terrific. And now that um, I saw a picture of the house before you started on it, I now know where it is because I remember seeing this derelict property behind a, a quite a high wall. Yes. Um, and there were mutterings about what it was meant for and what it had been. You've certainly made a wonderful job of restoring it. How long did it take you actually to complete the work? Well, um, I, in the first two years, I was a partner of, in a law firm in the city of London, so I didn't have a lot of time. But all my holidays and some long weekends were spent uh, on my hands and knees, grinding away at uh, whatever it might be. Uh, floors, and, floors and windows were the first huge job. We had a terrific day in October uh, 20, uh, 2001. We took all the windows, the four windows to bits on the, that you can see on the first floor. It was in late October and it was a blazing hot day. And we scraped them down and primed them. And the next day we, we uh, put uh, undercoat on and the next day top coats. Um, but rather than painting them in situ, we thought we'd paint them, we'd take them out and stack them against the walls inside so that they that we could get you know, get the paint properly to the edges. And I went away for lunch with my then girlfriend. And when we came back, 
the weather had deteriorated and a blizzard had set in and all the rooms had snow drifts in them. <laughs> I burst into tears. I think that's the only time I burst into tears, um, but recovered pretty quickly and um, you know, the rest is history. But yes, it's taken on and off. I, uh, um, I suppose the, the time spent actually working on the house alongside other things is maybe 10, year, 10 or 15 years, 10 years anyway. The last three years, three years were very intense because we overhauled the roof. Um, I rebuilt the uh, three chimneys. I also rebuilt that gable end or the top part of that gable end on the left. I put new masonry in on the uh, dormer windows. You'll see some of that masonry is new. And then a lot of lintels and sills are replaced. And I cut them, I cut and dressed them all myself. Um, it nearly killed me lifting some of these bits of stone up, and I did get help with that. But I think that's one of the things you don't realise with a house of this age. You look, you're used to looking at the new town, and you see a chimney stack 60 or 70 feet up, and it's two feet thick. The chimney stacks here are three feet thick, so they're half again the thickness. And the chimney stack that you see in the middle of the house is 24 feet high. It's enormous. So... Uh, just the quantities of material and the size of the blocks was something to, to reckon with, I have to say. <laughs> well, there was one more thing I wanted to ask you before. Yes. Um, being in a mining town, was there any sign of settlement at all? No, there's was... never been any mining under the, under the house. Um, I got a coal report before buying the place, and it's, it's perfectly clear from there that whatever mining there was under this part of Preston Pans is uh, many, many hundreds of metres down and so far down that it doesn't affect the surface. Having said that, there was mining uh, on the estate and further north in Preston Pans in parts of the town that were built in just before the Second World War and just after, you do occasionally see uh, cracks in the pavement and movement, but uh, luckily the laird thought it injudicious to mine under his own house. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for those answers. Um, would somebody else like to ask some questions of Finlay? Yes, yes, I'd like, yes. Oh. Far away. Uh, fin Finlay, is yes. this you? Yes. Um, about the painted walls and painted ceilings, do you have the impression that the colours were much more vivid originally, although they've been obviously concealed all this time and therefore saved, uh, the colours have faded, do you think? I mean, I was thinking sort of, you know, like classical, like the Parthenon and it was very bright colours. And yes. is that your impression of, of of how your painted ceilings and walls were as well? Well, I'm not an expert on the subject, but my feeling is probably not, because uh, the painted ceilings are all three feet or more above the height of the windows, so they never get any direct sunlight. Um, and the, whereas the, um, the fixing or rather the, the medium for the for the pigments is an organic substance the pigments themselves are minerals and whereas i'm sure that there's been some paint loss over the years and certainly in the dining room there's a darkening generally because of the use of coal fires and whatnot um, i don't think that the colors were greatly more vivid than they are now but I might be wrong. That's just my own hunch. Um, they're, they're quite earthy colours. The Thank blues you. may have faded a bit. I think Thanks. that's the one colour that does fade. Thanks. Right. Finley. Could, I, could I ask a question? Yes. It, as you go along the main road, there uh, is um, Ducat. Was that part of the policies of the house originally? Yes, it was. It, uh, it was only separated from the house in 1951. Oh, no. there, were market, there were market gardens. In fact, the estate was worked as a market garden by Miss McNeil all through the first half of the 20th century and even after she sold the house. I think I said something wrong. She didn't die at that point. 
she retained the land and sold the house with garden um, and bits of it were sold off piecemeal for development but the remainder was still worked as a market garden and right up until the 1960s mm. Thank you. can i ask um if historic scotland had any input into your restoration and yes giving um, you advice and so forth well it's it's an interesting one um I've got some close friends in historic Scotland, and I thought that to, to set off on the right foot, the right thing to do uh, was to invite the whole inspectorate down for a great big lunch. That's a good idea. <laughs> and in those days, they were allowed to do that. I don't think that's permitted anymore. And no, it was a, sure not. A, a big and delicious and boozy lunch, though I say it myself. And what I did in advance of that was to print up two full scat pages of the operations that I wished to carry out on the house in order to show them and say, look, these are my ideas. Um, which of them, if any, do you uh, disagree with? Um, and do you have anything you want to add? Well, to be honest, they weren't in a particularly technical mood after the lunch. <laughs> we, we had a nice, had a nice walk around the house. They basically said, look, uh, looks fine to us, you just get on with it. Um, and uh, I think part of the reason for that was that they, that they could see something of what I'd already done. And I explained that I wanted to intervene as little as possible. And I think then as now, they're very hot on preserving historic fabric, repairing. And I, I prefer not to think of it as a restoration, more a renovation or a loving yeah. back to life where you only discard a piece of historic fabric if it is no longer capable of sustaining the purpose it was uh, meant to sustain. And when they saw that, they relaxed completely. And in fact, some of my joinery is quoted in the uh, Historic Scotland booklets on how to do historic joinery as the way to do it. So I'm a bit chuffed about that too. Um, but I have never had a moment's trouble with them um, and that's not just because of the woozy lunch, it's because I've maintained a dialogue with them and uh, explained what I'm trying to achieve, and I've never once had a negative comment from anyone at Historic Scotland. Okay. Nor have I had any difficulty with the local authority, they've simply been delighted that somebody's doing it, which I think is easier to understand. More interestingly, perhaps, there is a conservation agreement on the house with the National Trust for Scotland. And for the first three years, I religiously wrote to them saying what I was planning to do and inviting them to come and have a look. And I never had the courtesy of a reply uh, for about five years. Then eventually somebody did turn up um, and said, what are you doing with Northfield House? So I said, well, I've written to you quite a lot to explain, but um, come down and have lunch and I'll show you what I'm doing. And the, the lady concerned was very nice. Um, she was embarrassed that they'd shown no interest. And she basically said, well, uh, there's nothing you're doing that we wouldn't approve of, so just carry on. <laughs> and that really, was, that really seems to have been the, my luck all the way through it. So uh, there's never been a moment's trouble. And I should say a word in defense of all, both those organizations. They're not there to create trouble. And they very, very seldom do create trouble unless you put before them a bad idea. If you put good ideas in front of them, of course they're going to say yes. And that's been my experience all the way through. Thanks very much, can, Finlay. Thank can you. I, can I ask where you learnt all your skills? <laughs> yes, it's a bit of a long story. I'll try and make it as short as possible because I think you, you're probably getting very fed up with the sound of my voice. <laughs> my mum and dad, um, my dad, now dead sadly, but my mum's still going strong, uh, were both great adventurers and unconventional. And uh, we lived for some years in uh, a rather conventional Victorian semi-detached house in Morningside. And mum was always, uh, you know, just anxious to get away from that. And she wanted to get back to the country and do something different. And eventually she persuaded dad that they should buy a derelict stable block at La Manca. It was called Whim Square. And it was an 18th century stable block with a magnificent classical front on it. And 
uh, it cons consisted of three sides of a square with a wall on the end, and the square was huge. It was 300 feet each way. Okay. Uh, two thirds of it had no roof, um, and half of the remaining third had been used as a deep litter chicken farm. <laughs> And the remainder was a very cold, dilapidated and miserable little house. And we all fell in love with it. And Mum and Dad sold the house in Morningside. They bought Whim Square and a little bit of extra land. They paid off their mortgage and they had 50 quid left over. I'm not teasing. They had 50 pounds left over. Dad was a, an academic at Edinburgh, so he had a salary. And Mum was a teacher a part time. And so they sat us around the table and they said, well, you wanted to do this just as much as we did. So we're going to have to renovate this place ourselves. So uh, here are some courses. Here are some books. Uh, let's learn the basic trades we need to learn in order to do this. Um, and all of us to an extent, but mainly myself and my brother Hamish, who is now a builder, um, picked up. Uh, the skills that we needed to do uh, joinery, carpentry, slating, lead work. I spent two months at York Minster learning the rudiments of stone masonry, which meant I could do all the stone cutting that was necessary and dressing. Uh, glazing, that's not very difficult. Wiring, that's not very difficult. Plumbing these days, that's really easy. Um, so well, what else is there? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> We just learned, we learned on the job and we got really good at it. I have to say, I mean, I think some of the stuff I did 30 years ago isn't as neat as what I would do now, but it was fine, better than any tradesman. And in fact, we were, we managed to impress the grant giving authority. Um, it was the HSBC in those days. And we were the first and only example of an A, a category A listed building which was restored with grant aid where the family was the contractor. So that's where I got the experience. And, the, and I think you have to combine that with a, an incurable um, virus or something which makes you want to do it. Being able to do it is one thing. Wanting to do it and live in dust and discomfort for all this time is, is a, really is a disease more than anything else I'd have thought. <laughs> Are you giving lessons um, by any chance, Loki? Are you taking classes to teach us DIY? <laughs> well, if I had time, but, um, but bear in mind, I'm now in my 62nd year and I've got this enormous project at Drummore ahead of yeah. me. Um, it's, it's tw it has twice the number of rooms that Northfield has um, and it's in far, far worse condition structurally and otherwise than Northfield ever was. It has, it's got 34 rooms and I think only seven of them have a complete ceiling and floor. Some of them have no ceiling, some have no floor, some have neither. It has, apart from the, where, where we have renovated it, it has no wiring, no heating and no plumbing. And the roof has, we, we've dealt with 18 outbreaks of dry rot. We have subsidence, we have wet rot, we have woodworm, uh, what else have we got? Eroded stone. We've got everything. It's just, oh, it's wonderful. It's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and what I'm, what I'm really hoping is that in due course, when all this COVID annoyance is over, and I don't mean to, to make light of it, I mean the annoyance of not being able to see each other, when all that is over, I think we should have an outing to drum war for the Musselboro Conservation Society. You can come and have a yeah. laugh. Yeah. That is absolutely yes. ideal. Okay. Bring our, well, tools, bring our tools with us, aren't we? 